Robert, um, thank you very much for joining us uh, today on Lunch Break with Business Plus, uh, sponsored sponsored by Mazda. Uh, Robert Dixon from Mason Hayes and Kern in the uh, the corporate team. Is there a big corporate team down there in Mason Hayes, Robert? Hi, Nick. Uh, yes. So lo lovely to speak to you as well this lunchtime and to everybody else. We do have a big corporate team. It, it kind of, uh, I think we've got 12 partners and 30 associates, something like that. Um, so so we, we do plenty of deals and we've been very busy, to be honest. And of course, it's not just takeovers. There's all sorts of other activity, I suppose, uh, private equity, uh, corporate investment, joint ventures. People just think of that M&A is just a deal, but it's a lot more than that, I imagine. Yeah, you're right. So I suppose we we'd act, we do kind of acquisitions on the buy side and on the sell side, I suppose, acting on one side or the other. Then you're right, there's different types of deal. It's it's not just buying or selling a business. Sometimes there's an investment where you have a company that's growing through rounds of investment and, and becomes very big through raising cash. So we do a lot of that sort of work as well. Then it's joint ventures and that sort of thing. And what we do find as well with a lot of our clients is obviously we, we we would do a deal with them, say an acquirer of a business, but then we end up doing a lot of advisory work with them going forward and, and you develop relationships that way. So it can, it can be very interesting to see them go on the journeys. So what's it been like since the, since the pandemic uh, occurred in, in March 2020? I mean, have you guys just all been doing this remotely? Absolutely, yes. So um, it's been, um, I mean, in, in terms of activity, I think what we've seen is in the last 12 months since the end of the summer 2020, it's been crazy bu busy with deals, to be honest. We've been run off our feet and um, probably in the initial few months, less so, I would say, as everyone paused for breath and wondered what they were going to do next. Um, but, but certain sectors have been hugely busy. In terms of the remote working so yes we've, we've had no choice we, we have i think 540 people in mason hayes and current so we're, we're not um I mean, I mean under government guidelines and so forth we couldn't just go into the office and, and yeah. continue as if everything was okay so what we have our office has been open the whole time but we've all had to work remotely and gear ourselves up from our own home offices and things and um, and the office is open to go in when we absolutely have to but we try to keep that very much to a minimum. So it's it's worked very well. Um, I think um, clients have got used to it and there's, you know, I don't think there's any disruption in service or if anything, you're, you're kind of more available than ever. And probably even with the return to office in whatever form it takes, like uh, this autumn and into the winter, probably a lot of remote activity is going to continue for us, you know, for, for what you do. Yeah, I think so. And, and obviously it remains to be seen. I think nobody knows yet when it's actually possible and, and when this whole thing is over in terms of, um, the, you know, um, the, the pandemic and everything. Um, some people's perspectives will have changed. People have the opportunity to go and help coaching with their kids, that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that mightn't have been possible if, if, you're, if you're working all hours in an office. In town. So I think there will be um, differences there. I think most businesses are are going to give people the opportunity to mix it up and do a number of days in the office and a couple of days at home in the week, that sort yeah, of thing. But yeah. it's, listen, it's up in the air at the moment. Okay. I think people listen, will make their decisions, so I, I won't jump the gun. Let's talk about uh, why we're here today, which is about uh, selling your business and uh, the, some of the factors that people want want to keep in mind. Um, you know, Whether you're selling your business or not, or whether you go to market with the business or, or, or somebody approaches you. Um, I understand that one of the issues that arises are, are, are the kind of simple things in one way that the that the other side of the transaction will, will want to have in order. So I'm thinking here of things like, uh, you know, um, your employee contracts, for instance, uh, the contracts that you have with your, your suppliers or whatever, even the assets uh, that you hold in your business, you know, exactly who owns them. Are they owned by the director or are they owned by the company? These are, these are actually kind of ongoing good housekeeping things that a lot of businesses should do, but don't. And then suddenly in a deal, perhaps these things raise their head and uh, they can kind of cause delays. Is, is that a correct uh, view of, of things? That's absolutely correct. All of that is true, Nick. I, I mean, I think um, what we sometimes, anybody that's kind of advising on deals and that, you, you sometimes forget that if there's a seller, particularly if individuals have grown up a business and maybe taken investment over time and then go to sell it, this is a huge lifetime event. You know, it's, it's a huge part of somebody's life. They've grown up their business and they're exiting for a good amount 
of return, I suppose. Um, it, it, it's a hugely significant moment. And I think what you need to do in advance, if, if, if you're growing a business and the business is developing, it's, it's not just kind of thinking about these things when you're in the kind of um, in, in the fire of the deal, so to speak, you know, that you're in the, the, the number of months that it might take to consummate a transaction. So you need to be thinking this way well in advance uh, and all along. And the sorts of things you talk about there, Nick, are absolutely right in terms of housekeeping and um, having employment contracts in place. Um, you know, these are all things you should you should do anyway irrespective of a sale but I think having that protection there I think one thing that's very important it's more important in some sectors and types of businesses than others is intellectual property so what you don't want if you have contractors for example in your business you don't want to not have any agreement in place whether it's in the contractor agreement or somewhere else it can be literally something very simple a few lines making clear that any intellectual property that they generate through their activities for the company is belongs to the company. And the reason you have to be careful around that is that, you know, if you have an employee that is has an employment contract and so forth, and they generate IP that is automatically legally owned by the company. Yeah. Whereas if you have a contractor and they generate IP, it's automatically not owned by the company. It's all, it's that, that must be a big issue these days because on the IT side, especially, so many companies turn to the services of, of contractors. And when the buyer comes along, the buyer is concerned, well, that contractor worked on that piece of your website or something much more complicated than that. And do they own it or do you own it or what? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a question of, of the facts of, of the particular... The, I mean, if, if you don't have a, a robust agreement in place, that states that the IP generated is the the intellectual property generated is is the own is owned by the company. If it is a contractor, the, con, the the company does not own it. Now it's never necessarily black and white and simple. And if you're in that situation, you're litigating it, of course. As yeah. a company, you'll try and come up with whatever you can. But I mean, I think it's certainly as a buyer coming in, it's it's one of the things that there's a whole load of subjects you're you're looking at. You're looking at obviously depending on the nature of the business, the real estate. Is it, you know, is, is, is what's the situation with the lease or so forth? You're looking at employment, as you say, Nick. You're looking at data protection. You're looking at the contracts. Are they actually just to just hold just hold you on data, data protection there, there yeah. now? Because you know, since GDPR, um, you know, it's much tighter data protection rules, and especially around simple things, even like uh, you know, who are who are you emailing in your business, and do you have their permission or not? Are they B two B? Are they consumers? And if you're not playing totally by the GDP or rules, maybe the buyer will uh, will you certainly stick you for a warranty or indemnity on it, any any problem that will arise. It's it's true. And it's certainly a focus for buyers because actually, I think for most businesses or all businesses, I would say it is very, very difficult to comply 100% with everything it, that, that's required by GDPR. I think that's that's the reality of it. I think there is a big difference we see on transactions between businesses that have appeared to have made no effort or almost no effort to comply whatsoever and businesses that have made a genuine effort and have put resource and time into it and can demonstrate that. I think as a buyer, you know, a buyer will be concerned if, you know, obviously they'll be particularly concerned if there's an actual um, you know, an actual investigation or complaints or that sort of thing. Of course, that's yeah. top of the list in terms of concerns or, or an actual fine or, or something. Next kind of big concern would be if clearly nothing has been done to try and protect and remedy and comply with those stringent requirements. And you're right, Nick, it's just been a huge source of, um, you know, source of attention i suppose over the last number of years since since it, it might not collapse a deal but it, as i said it'll certainly the the buyer will will be uh, insisting on all, all sorts of uh, uh, guarantee yeah, we, damages and, and, from the vendor that's right and and typically we'd see warranties any like we warranties are the kind of statements of facts about the target business and to get away with no warranties about data protection would be fairly unheard of yeah. Whereas you're right, if you stray into indemnities, which is your euro for euro protection for every, that's where you're seeing an actual liability or a problem. But, you know, we, we do see, an, uh, it, it's very hard to really comply with everything, I think. It's, yeah, there's so much yeah. in it that I think you just want to get 
What, what about more, more mundane things, Robert, like, you know, statutory books and banking records? You know, a lot of, say, for instance, a lot of, well, especially SMEs, but even large SMEs, you know, they might be supposed to have an AGM all the time, but they don't. They just go from year to year and they sign off the accounts, etc. Do, do those sort of issues raise a difficulty? At, they at do. Uh, it, it's, and I focus particularly there on the kind of register of members, um, Nick, and the ownership of the company. It seems a very obvious and simple thing but we definitely do see that particularly as you say sme level if if, if there's you know if, if perhaps if you haven't gone through an investment round but even if you have it's it's a pro like there might be situations where some somebody has done some work for the business over a period of time and there was a loose arrangement perhaps even only oral arrangements to grant that individual some shares in the company and it hasn't been put in yeah. place Things like that, I, I've talked to people who are at a developing stage at times and they just haven't been aware, for example, of the need for a register of members. Um, register of members is your only evidence of who actually owns the company. So it's very, very important document um, and you have to keep it up to date. So, so you do see that and you see it perhaps more on investment rounds than, than on sales, but you have to, I, I think those details should be, you know, focused upon i think the thing we sometimes have to remember is those entrepreneurs who have built up a really successful business they've a million things to deal with and sometimes something like that isn't isn't top of their priority list that's some people some people are completely different to that and are but but those things like you're kind of giving somebody if you think of a buyer is going to hire lawyers going to hire different uh, deal team something like that will just give them an easy thing yeah. to aim at and target and, and, and complain about so you, you want to remove any of those easy obstacles and you're right as well nick on, on banking documents and things like that it's just having your house in order knowing exactly what your facilities are and being able to provide them all to a buyer very simply you know well i suppose yeah. like, like there are two type, type types of deals where someone's selling their business one is that they they set out to sell their business and they have a plan and the other one of course they're just trundling along and someone comes along and says, I want to buy your business. And then, then you might be scrambling to do those issues. But if it's your plan to sell your business, uh, I know you're very, very keen on, on the idea of establishing a data room, as you call it, uh, right from the get go, so that these sort of issues are addressed well in advance of anything that might take place. So could you explain to me in, in, the, in the big law world, I suppose, what a data room is? So a data room, for the purposes of a transaction is where the, the, the party selling or the company taking investment, as the case may be, sets up this virtual kind of site or, or room, if you like, virtually where you just click a link to go into it and then there's subfolders and so on that sets out all the important information that a buyer or an investor is going to want to see. So you might have um, all the subjects we've just talked about would have their own section and then subsection. So take employment, for example, you might have an employment might be section five of, of 12 sections or something like yeah, that. Yeah. And then you'd have key employment agreements. You might have trade union agreements. You might have different things like that set out. And what you want, so first of all, on an actual deal, you want that to be really well organized, really well populated. There can be kind of tactical concerns about if you're early in a process and you're not sure if the buyer is kind of, you're, you're not right at the end and the buyer could walk away and you don't want them to see certain contracts before that, you, you might want to think about that a little bit in terms of timing of making certain things available. But Nick, you make a really good point there, which, which um, about maybe having a data room in advance of a transaction. And that doesn't mean committing huge amounts of time to get it in, in an exact perfect state. It's just sort of as you develop as a company thinking, OK, where are my key agreements so that if the time comes that you decide, OK, I want to kick off a process to sell my business yeah. or even if you get approached, you actually have the work 80 percent or 85 percent done and you have the documents dumped into an area in 12 different sections. You have your key contracts, you have your um, data protection compliance documents, you have pensions materials because i can't tell you how many times in a deal we've seen momentum stalled delays and ultimately a deal can sometimes fall over when you're not ready to 
sort of produce that data room as a seller or the seller isn't ready to do so. Questions come in from a buyer because you don't have all the information there and then it's two weeks before the responses actually come back. And when I go back to what I said at the beginning about just how important a deal is, you know, this is a key event potentially in, in a seller's um, life really and to not be prepared to actually jump through the hoops that you know you're going to have to jump through is, is just a real shame. So that's why I'm suggesting if if this is something that could ever happen with your business, <clears throat> you just do it as you go. And, you know, not that you- I know, but in practice, Robert, how often yeah. does that happen? I mean, somebody might have a business that's been going for say, I don't know, 15 years, you know, good SME or whatever, they're getting a bit older, they might think, okay, uh, or because of COVID, it's about time to check out of here. It's usually quite a, be, it'd be rare enough, I imagine the kind of person who said, who said five years ago, oh, I'm going to sell my business in 2021 and this is what I'll do. I mean, do, or maybe a lot of more people are out there are organized than I think there are. No, I think it's a fair comment, Nick. I mean, where we do see, and we do see for a lot of clients actually, that they have a data room they just keep and it's ongoing. It's not just for one transaction. In fairness, where we see that most, is where it's clients that are actually doing deals all the time, taking yeah. investment all the time. So some of these clients are in super fast growth mode and they're doing very well and they have loads of investors trying to come in. And I suppose when an investor comes along, typically they will want to say, well, where's all the information if I'm sticking X yeah, yeah, in yeah. I need? So in those types of situations, in fairness, Nick, you see it more. I suppose what I'm saying is, whether it's a data room or, or what, you know, just to have access to this information quite quickly so that it's not an impossible task that would almost put you off doing a deal. But yeah, yeah. But I, I, suppose, I, I mean, an alternative place. without somebody turning up with a lawyer and asking for a data room, even as a good housekeeping kind of exercise, I suppose they could just set up their own Dropbox yeah. and just be conscious of, oh, what have I done about it this year? What have I, have I put in the latest employment contracts? Whatever, it's just a piece of advice, yeah. you know? I'm it? certainly not suggesting anybody um, spend money on the, you know, it, it's a Dropbox or something that you can do for free, I think is more or very cheaply is, is what I'm talking about. Just be aware with those things. So first of all, security and privacy, you know, don't make sure that, that, that you know, it can't be compromised or the information can't be obtained yeah, yeah. through a weak password or something like that. Um, and equally, when you actually go into a transaction, there are some data rooms that are notoriously poor um compared to others i won't i won't name any names um so so just make sure you're advised as to what's a good one that isn't going okay. to wind up the buyer and hit its advisors um from the seller's perspective robert can we just talk a bit about the anatomy of the deal you know um i suppose what i'm getting at here is that do presumably you're, you're got in touch with now it might be in fairness it might be some of the firms that you're helping with the investment thing all along but then does the owner come to you or do their accountants come to you? And what's your conversation like with the vendor at the early stage of this process? Yeah, and I think it's the, the anatomy of a deal point is really is, is a good when we're talking about kind of preparing to sell your business. I think sellers understand how a deal tends to run so that if you haven't done it before in particular. So the years there aren't surprises and so forth. Um, in terms of that, I mean, quite often, we've typically had a prior to that, so we might have acted for relations and then they go to sell. Um, so so we, we see a lot of that. I mean, I think the conversation I would try to have is, is to kind of make sure that the person is um, aware of exactly what the different steps are that there is a, a stage that the buyer will want to work through their due diligence and ask a load of questions about that, that the buyer will typically provide the transaction, the acquisition agreement, the existence of a disclosure process um, and the other types of documents that come into it. So that everyone understands timelines and, and really work together to set out a timeline and try and keep control of the I just stop you there for a second, because I mean, for the person who, who hasn't gone through this process before, and they, they, they'd be very familiar with the, the concept of due diligence, what, what does due diligence entail? I mean, uh, the buyer throws at you a huge amount of questions, I suppose, uh, that you have to go through and answer. It, it, it's quite a demanding process, I imagine. 
It is. I mean, I think it, it can buy the approach of different buyers can vary in terms of how deep they like they want to go and, and how many questions they ask. The, the things that almost always happen. So the control you have as the seller is generating a data room and almost getting the, the first um, stealing the first march on that um, right. and saying this is this is the order of us. The buyer will typically almost always if, if they've hired a a lawyer, uh, any sort sort of sophisticated, you know, lawyer that's familiar with deals and that, they will produce a due diligence questionnaire with all the, the questions they expect to be answered. And you will need to go through all those pages and just say, cross refer to the data room or answer, say yes, no, whatever it might be. Um, so that'll be a step. Oh, sorry, Joe, just holding up there. So if you haven't, if you don't have that data room process or Dropbox, yeah. whatever you want to call it, in hand, you're going to be landed with a huge amount of work. It sounds yes, to me. That's it. That's it. And you you can obviously do absolutely nothing and then say, okay, what do you want to know? But they will want to know things that take you a lot of time to pull together if you're not if you're not ready. And yeah. I think from there, the, the, you know what will happen is the buyers advisors and this isn't just legal this is obviously financial tax and um, you know whatever else might be depending on the nature of the business will go away and will look at all those answers will look at the documents in the data room they will have a scope of work i suppose with their own clients the buyer where they will agree how much detail they look at the different things they will go off and assess all that and questions will come back and forth that the seller has to deal with and they'll say, well, OK, you've given us this pension document. Where is the actual trust scheme document? You know, yeah. things like that, that, that will come back and you'll just have to go and try and deal with it. You see very different approaches from sellers. You get you get a huge amount of almost aggression sometimes or frustration where it's, you know, what can happen is a million, a lot of questions are asked and sometimes they're duplicative. Sometimes you have a, a kind of a, a, an accountant asking a question and a similar question comes from a lawyer. I think as a seller and seller's advisors, you want to keep control of that as best you can. And, and yeah, I'd, do, say, I'd, say, I'd say that's easier said than done because after all, the buyer is the guy writing the check, you know? Yeah, it's a balance. I mean, I've, I've, I see different approaches. I think if, if a seller has a certain amount of power, let's say it's an auction process and you get two or three buyers who are like scrambling over each other to try and buy this business, a seller can sort of say, listen, no more than 10 questions a day and we won't be taking any more questions after this. You know, you, you yeah, can actually, yeah. the risk you take with anything like that is, of course, that the wrong type of buyer just won't be bullied about stuff like that and won't do the deal unless their questions are dealt with. So just, just as a matter of interest, at what stage of this process then does the transaction price emerge? Because I presumably a vendor won't get involved in any of this until they have some kind of guide price. Or do you only get into due diligence after you've agreed a price for the business or yes. the price change so, as you go on? Absolutely. And it's a thing we definitely recommend is that a heads of terms or term sheet is signed before. And, and that that's not, you know, the full scale legal document. It's a non- that, But that would include the price that's being yeah. prepared to be paid, right? Yeah. Exactly. And it'll need other key terms as well. Keep it quite simple make sure it's clear what parts of it are binding and not binding. And, you know, you'll expect exclusivity, a buyer will expect exclusivity before they sign that. Yeah. But, you know, the but how, how, does, how does the buyer know how much to pay unless they've actually been able to get under the hood? Well, I mean, I suppose a buyer will have a good sense of the business, what the, they'll have been told some of the figures in terms of turnover, EBITDA, whatever yeah. else it might be they'll know the projections and the reasons. So there'll be a very clear calculation as to how that's been worked out. So really due diligence is confirmatory. It's not an exercise to try and work out how much to pay for the business. Sometimes if something huge comes up, there might be some adjustment to the price. Yeah. So if suddenly there's a claim that's likely to result in a 1 million liability within the next year, there are different ways to deal with that. One might be a slight reduction in the price, but you know, diligence as a seller, you don't want to go down that road and then find out that the price is, is not one you're willing to part with your business for. So it's definitely very important to nail those details down before you can make that start. Yeah. Listen, we're nearly done. Uh, I've got a question here. I don't know if it's in your area, really, though. Um, Robert, um, how do you target the most likely purchases of your business? Purchases? Yeah, 
it, it's a good point. So, and that that sort of assumes you're selling your business without sort of, you know, sometimes as we talked about, Nick, somebody has actually approached you or you have an existing, let's say, customer who wants to buy your business. If you are looking to target, um, you know, buyers, what I would say is you can either go through the kind of corporate finance route, which is a lot of deals we would see a corporate finance advisor, advisor gets appointed and they effectively go and find you a buyer and run a process for you and um, in terms of who they decide to target they will have they should have a database of uh, and contacts and connections of you know business it'll be a mixture of maybe private equity or depending on you know venture capital if it's an investment but private equity buyers or trade buyers yeah. and you know you make a decision based on that there are, depending on the sector, there are plenty of willing buyers in the market looking to deploy their cash. So it's just a question of finding the right. Well, that's, that's an interesting point you make there, because it seems that you were saying that you, you, Ace and Hayes, have been very busy over the past 12 months. And I think, is there a combination of factors going on here that there's, because, because of the pandemic, you've got two things going on. One is that a lot of businesses um, have time, a lot of business owners obviously have time to step back during the pandemic. And review their options either deciding look i'm gonna to have to buy somebody to grow this business out of trouble or else this guy saying look i've had enough i'm getting out where's my buyer please so and, and then of course you've always got private equity and people looking for a return when you can't get any money on your deposit anything that's thrown up a bit of cash is, is a valuable asset so what do you do you expect this kind of momentum m a momentum that you're seeing to continue in the immediate future I, I think I think I am just just on what we're seeing on pipeline and so forth. And I think that the factors you've mentioned there, Nick, are all relevant. I mean, I think it, it depends on the sector because um, it, it's if any if ever there's been a, a kind of a variety due to force majeure factors, if you like, you know, um, it, it's this it's this pandemic. Like the last year and a half, of course, we've seen excellent businesses. In huge difficulty because they because of what's happened you know you know because of planes haven't been flying and and tourism hasn't been there and and you know you know restaurants haven't been able to open so i mean there's different different um businesses that have been would, would have flourished you look at technology so we're just seeing you know if you think of some of the types of businesses that have become more valuable over the last period of time because of that you're seeing transactions there you're seeing certain sectors like care homes happen to have been very, very, you know, just due to the demographics that were there beforehand and international players coming into the market. You know, yeah, it's just the pre-existing state of the market there. I think what you say there, Nick, about private equity certainly is very true in terms of cash being there to be deployed and a willingness to do so. Um, and I don't know, your, your point is very interesting then as well about people's mindsets potentially shifting. Obviously, the last year and a half has given everyone plenty to reflect on in different ways. So, I mean, yes, I think there definitely are circumstances in which people have said, well, maybe it's a good time for me to um, yeah. look, look for an exit. So I think I think it's a mix of all those, but it's, it's certainly been very buoyant. Listen, Robert, you've been very, very good with your time. And uh, I think it's about time for all of us to, to go off and, and, and get a sambo. And thanks to Master again. Just in, I know that people can go to the Mason Hayes and Curran website and you're there. They can look up Robert Dixon and see you and your contact details are there. So you don't mind people who, who might be impressed by you and who might want to sell their business reaching out to you directly. Of course. Well, well hopefully. And, and listen, a pleasure to um, speak to you, Nick, and, and hope everyone else uh, you know enjoyed it. Definitely very happy if anyone wants to reach out, even if it's not, I'm, I'm selling my business now. If you had a question about anything, very happy to deal with that or have a chat. Okay, well, listen, very, very, very nice talking to you. And um, thanks very much for your time today, Robert. Yeah, absolutely. Cheers. Pleasure. Cheers. Bye-bye. <clears throat>